What up, y'all? Hey, hey. Kitty. <laughs> it worked. It's working. Beautiful. What's up? How's it going, y'all? What's going on? It's great. Stoked to be talking to you. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> Although I did see your face not 24 hours ago. Yes. That's great. <laughs> so, sorry. I'm going to do not disturb so they don't be interrupting and shit. Can we say shit? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Say, what, say whatever you want. That's the beauty okay. of this. <laughs> <Shit>. <laughs> Let me just... Give me one second. Yeah. There it is. Do not disturb. So people ain't going buck wild. All right. Cool. Yay! Hi, friends. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Candace. Hi. G good to good to meet you for the first time. I know you and Allie are uh, much better acquainted, but it's awesome to have you on. <laughs> Thanks. I barely know her. She actually just <laughs> and uh, was like, hey, uh, what are you doing? I'm just kidding. No, we know each other. That's Very awesome. good. <laughs> uh, I told Alia, I'm going to hop off in a second here and uh, let the two of you converse without me. But uh, I wanted to first say hello to you and then um, give you a quick little background on full table and the project and all. And, um, if you have any questions, happy to answer them, but then I'll, I'll depart. So uh, <laughs> basically, Full Table started about a year and a half ago, and I was just and myself having dinner, basically. And we created conversation with depth, I call it, by having one person share about themselves. And so somebody would say, hey, I learned this song on guitar, or I started a business, and they got to share and present to the group, and then we kind of just chat for a bit. Um, that was pre-COVID, so they were all in my house, and it was like a potluck and really casual. And so I transferred it onto Zoom for um, these corona times and partnered up with Allie and Graham, who are recently engaged, as you know. And yes. <laughs> uh, keep bringing that up. It's like, it's like, yeah. <laughs> and um, so they've been working with me as the chefs, pretty much, for Full Table, as, as well as some other kind of odd jobs I can assign their way, which has been phenomenal. But um, mm -hmm. the whole idea of Full Table is focused on uh, inclusion and love and kind of just celebrating the commonalities of people, right? And yeah. the past week or two have really highlighted how that is an issue in the country and in the world. Um, and it has been for a long time, but that I think for a lot of people, it's uh, an awakening in some ways. Um, and so for Graham, Ali, myself, even though the project is very, very young and very casual at this point, we, uh, we talked and we felt that it was necessary to um, take action ourselves, you know, and kind of say, hey, how can we work diversity into full table at this point so that in 10 years when there's a million people involved that it's like a given and that it's everybody feels like they can come to full table and be loved and uh, included. So in doing so, we figured we'd take a little time to talk with members of the black community like yourself and kind of just hear your stories, hear your perspectives um, and take the time to learn from you um, as best as we can. So that's a little about full table and where we're at and why we invite you here today. Um, if there are any questions, happy to answer them. But otherwise, I'll be quiet and step aside and let you two chat. Um, I mean, I don't really have any questions, um, not particularly, maybe later on. Perfect, yeah. Um, but, um, I mean, you ain't got to, like, leave or anything, <laughs> which is funny. Um, but um, thanks for having me. And this is, um, this is really great. Um, thank you. And I'm very proud to participate in any sort of platform that raises awareness for people that look like me. You know what I mean? So I'm Wonderful. happy to be here. Let's do it. Yay. Thank you. I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Sweet. Hi, Candace. Hi, friend. How are you doing today? Uh, not bad. Not bad at all. Um, weird morning, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that one later. <laughs> <laughs> 
So welcome on. I'm so stoked to have you. As some of you know, Candace is one of my best friends. Uh, but I wanted to kind of just pass on to you, give everyone a quick little bio, where, you, where you're from, who you are, um, how old you are, whatever you want to share. Um, so yeah, I'm Candace. <laughs> Candace Otis. I'm 26 years old. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I recently moved back to California after doing um, um, a lot of time on the East Coast. I uh, went to school out there um, and I cooked in a few restaurants. Uh, so I went to culinary school out there, I should say, mm -hmm. and, and cooked um, in a few restaurants in the South. And then I moved back mm -hmm. to California recently, like a year ago. And now I'm in San Francisco and it's great. That's actually how I met Allie here. Yeah. <laughs> That's progress. Cooking. Yeah. Um, so with that, um, I wanted to open it up with just talking about you as a cook, as a chef, um, as being a woman, as being a black woman, and mm -hmm. how, you know, how like your success as a chef has empowered you as a black woman within our industry. Would you mind enlightening us on something like that? Um, yeah. I mean, I... I actually had a really good conversation with a fellow other black chef of mine um, and we call each other, well, I call her unicorns um, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> there, we're very few and far in between. Uh, but when you see yeah. you're amazed <laughs> and you're like, oh my <laughs> God, yes. Uh, so um, that's great to see. Uh, but it's, I don't know, it's, it's a double, it has a lot of weight to it, I should say. Yeah. Um, there's, it's already hard enough being a woman in general. And then you have to mm -hmm. add race and one of the most oppressed race, you know what I mean, in society on top of that. And then still yeah. be in a male dominated and white dominated world and industry. And that's the hospitality industry. So when I do see somebody that looks like me, I do get it very excited. <laughs> yeah. um, and it makes me want to work even harder to set an example for somebody else to see that, hey, mm -hmm. she can do it. She looks like me. Why the hell not? You know what I mean? So um, I do pride myself in it. And I'm very proud of um, the doors I've been able to, um, like, enter into and then also earn to stay there. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also it's also alarming as well to see how little women and black people are represented in the caliber of places that I've I've had the pleasure of working you know what I mean so it, it's I actually had a conversation a while back with one of my mentors and my chefs and he um good friend of mine um he basically, I asked him, I said, hey, uh, how many, just picking your brain here, how many uh, um, black people do you, or person of color, I should say, yeah. how many person of color comes in here and stages? And he's like, and, and he's been there the entire time the restaurant's been open. He was like, I, you know, a, a handful, more than a handful. I was like, okay. I was like, okay, great. And how many of them were women? And he was like, uh, that's even lesser. And I was like, okay, we'll take out the person of color. How many of them were women in general? And he was like, that's less too. So it, and it, it was, it was also, and we had a beautiful and deep conversation about it and basically came to the extent of just like, there, there are two problems. One, why aren't we seeing them? Mm -hmm. Or why aren't they getting the job? But two, why aren't they applying? You know what I mean? So, yeah. And that's a whole nother conversation about, you know, systemic, you know, uh, pressures and social class and also just people not believing that, you know, they could be in the type of restaurants. Because I've worked at beautiful, high caliber restaurants, James Beard award winning, Four Diamond, like I have, I have been through some pretty great doors, but I was the only person that looked like me that I saw. And anytime I did see somebody that looked like me, unfortunately, they were a dishwasher. So it's, it's, it's unfortunate. And also, like I said, alarming, you know what I mean? Yeah. And anytime I can say, Hey, yo, like, if I can do it, you definitely can do it. Because 
it's ironic because the best people I know are black, are, are the best cooks I know are black women. And, mm -hmm. and they've been cooking for their family for years, for right. generations, for years yeah. and years and years. History has, has proved that women are like the matriarchy, like they can cook for their family. They are the person like providing and being hospitable, but you never see them in a kitchen or in a higher, you know, any position. Yeah. More than that. And it's beautiful now that women are being recognized more and more these days. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we've got Ashley Christensen, we've got, uh, we've got plenty that have won James Beard's awards that are running their own kitchens that are getting the accolades that they deserve, which is great. Um, and there are other black chefs that are also getting accolades as well. Um, um, in, I'm, blanking on his name, um, Soler and uh, June Baby. He just won uh, the James Beard. Uh, he's mm -hmm. amazing. And um, down in Charleston, um, um, Rodney Scott, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And they're black and that's amazing. But it's like, yeah. also, when, when are we gonna have more uh, Mashallah Baileys? You know what I mean? When are we gonna have more black female chefs that are being spotlighted? Because those are the best cooks that I know. Those are the people that are running things. But you mm -hmm. don't get to see them on a higher platform and it's unfortunate. So I, anytime I see one of us, <laughs> I get really excited yeah. because I'm like, hey, <laughs> maybe this is it. Maybe we've got a shot. So I'm a huge that, fan. That was favorite stories was when a cook who previously was a pastry chef or a pastry cook at the progress came by and she oh, oh my god she uh works at a different restaurant now but she came in to eat her fro was so huge and she came in and was just like hey <laughs> oh my goodness we saw each other from across the room and it was like true love um ashley davis um, yeah she was <sighs> I've only met her twice, but I feel like we're such good friends. We just wanted <laughs> each other across, and we saw it, and we locked eyes, and we smiled, but we were, like, nervous. And then she was talking to another uh, good friend of ours and coworker, Sophie Hirsch. And Sophie brought her and came to talk to me, and, and she was just like, hey, um, I'd love to, like, you know, I, I don't want to be weird, but I'd love to, like, talk to you. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I wanted to talk to you. <laughs> relish in the fact that we see another black person and another black woman standing like in a kitchen right. and like acknowledging each other and it was just beautiful. yeah uh, uh, it was so great <laughs> <laughs> so do you do you have I guess this might be a, a uh an ignorant question but do you know why or have any idea why black women aren't necessarily represented in restaurants because they are in your eyes such incredible cooks or what you've described as like some of the best cooks you've ever encountered. Do you know why they're not in restaurants? Is it more just that they have other passions or careers they're pursuing? You know, it's, it's a hard question to answer um, because it's all, it's subjective, but it's not. Um, mm -hmm. For me personally, my father told me I could do anything I wanted um yeah. you know what i mean and my mother and my father raised me to say hey you need to work hard you need to do um you, you, like whatever you do make sure you're good at it you know what i mean mm -hmm. and that means practice and that means working hard mm -hmm. and they were blessed and um passionate and hardworking enough to be able to put me in those positions like i was raised comfortably i wasn't raised rich or you know um you know in the poorer sense like you know middle class you know what yeah. i mean so i and a long-winded way of saying i for me personally there wasn't anything that was going to stop me from becoming what i wanted to be mm -hmm. um but that was because i was lucky enough to have the the social and the economic um you know uh, blessings so and it's so and it's so crazy because i know so many beautiful black women that are like when i tell them what i do and they ask or friends they're like what do you do and i'm like oh i'm a chef they're like oh, you know what i love cooking i always wanted to be a chef i love it I, it just feels so good to me it's so cathartic it's so relaxing it's so much fun and i was like why don't you do it and they're like 
nah, you know, like I have this or I have that or, you know what I mean? Like, and there's not, there's not, it, it's unfortunate because it's something that they want to do. It's something that a, an idea was in their head, but mm -hmm. because society has deemed them to be more responsible or quote unquote, go to school for, uh, or be a receptionist or be whatever, you know what I mean? Like be something that puts, uh, you know, food on the table and yeah. money in the bank, not necessarily following their dreams. They, they don't have time for their dreams. And a lot of that has to do with oppression. And that a lot, a lot of that has to do with systematic racism in the sense mm -hmm. of they grew up in a certain time and a certain class and a certain system that is fundamentally disadvantaged for them. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and that, like most of them, I'm, I'm not saying everybody, like I said, it can be subjective, but that is my theory in the sense of what I told you earlier one they're not applying and two we don't see them you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it could go either way honestly i mean that's yeah. my thing <laughs> <laughs> do you find that your situation or do you find that in charleston it was a lot more um how do i put this do you find that in charleston Black women in kitchens, or even just women in general, was way um, less common than in LA or in San Francisco? Or do you find that maybe because in some ways the population is kind of flipped, um, that there are more Black women in kitchens in Charleston rather than like San Francisco or you know, anywhere that you've worked? Yeah. In, in no. Providence, Rhode Island, whatever. Yeah. Um because I've lived in Rhode Island, I've lived mm -hmm. in Charleston, I've lived in Los Angeles, and I've lived in San Francisco. And out of all of them, well, I can't really count Los Angeles because I didn't really professionally cook yeah. in, in, in LA. Not, the, uh, not at the level that, you know what I mean? I started in the, you know. Um, so out of all th three of those, San Francisco was the most um, eclectic. Yeah. Uh, San Francisco was the first kitchen I worked in where there was another woman there um, mm -hmm. before I got there. Exactly. What up? Uh, and Charleston, Charleston was great. It was wonderful. It was amazing. It was so important to my career, to myself, to the effect uh, uh, that people have had on my heart and soul. And I treasure it forever. I love Charleston, but a, a really big flaw and a reason why I left, one, I missed my family, but two, um, it just, it was quote unquote disappointing on how little representation I saw um, of people that looked like me. And, mm -hmm. and, and I said, if if I saw a black person in that kitchen, they were a dishwasher. Yeah, it was unfortunate, and I was the first woman in a very well, maybe not a very long time, but I was the first woman in a hot minute to be in that kitchen and to be a stable person in that kitchen too. And I worked myself all the way throughout the line. Shout out to Jason Stanhope uh, at Fig, who gave me an incredible opportunity. Um, beautiful, wonderful, amazing man. Um, but it was it was interesting when he hired me because he's dope he's down he is all for it he is such a like he's a great person and we we would have conversations um and i was like yo am i like the first woman in a hot minute and he was like yeah and he was like i think diversity is so important and i was like you preaching to the choir homie like <laughs> that's what i'm here man and he's like no like and he's like, I mean, like, you're great. And you are like, obviously, like, your skills are here. Like, you know, you've got a lot to learn, but I think you have great potential. But it's also, you know, like, you're a catalyst for a lot of change here. Because, I mean, all I was working with were, you know, white men under the age of between the ages of 25 and 35. You know what I mean? So, and who am I? And I was also the only woman the youngest and the only person of color. So I was like a triple whammy. It was yeah. a lot. Um, and it, it was difficult. 
I look back on it in hindsight and I don't know what the hell I was thinking. I was just like, yeah, I want to work here. So I'm going to work here. But man, oh man, it was really, really hard some days to, to feel just so on the outside of things, you know what I mean? And like, don't get me wrong, the, the boys that I work with are like, they are great guys. Like they are really solid human beings uh, for the most part. But at the same time, I would definitely have to check them um, because it, they, there are moments that they did not agree with. You know what I mean? There are moments that I did not agree with them. So um, I just, a long-winded way of saying, I didn't see a lot of people that look like me in Charleston, which was very, very disappointing because I expected the complete opposite because Charleston is has a huge Black population, but a lot of them are impoverished. Um, a lot of them are not in, in food. And I had staged in many kitchens um, before I got the job at FIG. And I was the only person that looked like me. I was the only person. And it was at different levels too. They were mostly at high fine dining places, but I didn't see anybody that looked like me. And then maybe in one of the kitchens was ran by a woman. So that was great. Um, yeah. But for the most part, wow. it was just, it was just um, white men. So um, that, that is the norm apparently, but it still doesn't make me feel any better. <laughs> no, yeah, of course not. And I, I'm like equally as shocked. It's wild. Uh, so then in those situations where you were, you know, pretty uncomfortable with whatever was going on, did you take opportunities to, you know, just kind of like, tell them that it's not okay or like did you ever try to share your perspective to try and like enlighten others about the situation I'm not sure exactly what you had ex what you had uh, experienced necessarily but at least in Charleston did you ever or because you were kind of like a baby still like baby cook was that a challenge for you to be able to stand up if you did um, yes and no. I, I, I've definitely picked my battles um, mm -hmm. because it was a fine line between, like you just said, like I was a baby cook. I was, it was my first job out of culinary school. This yeah. is my first professional gig. It is an award-winning James Beard a restaurant. Like it is held to a high standard and um, I'm cooking with some pretty good chefs. Like these, these guys can cook. Mm -hmm. and I'm I'm I just want to I'm so hungry and I just want to absorb and I just want them to I'm so green I'm so yeah. <laughs> green but I still like because I'm hardworking and because I, I love food and because I want to be there hell yeah I'm gonna work my ass off and I'm gonna do what I need to do so there was a there is when I say I picked my battles it was trying to find the balance between being um, not disrespectful, you know what I mean? When they're teaching me something or mm -hmm. when they're enlightening me, because I, there's a lot of things that I didn't know, but at the same time, still understanding that they can't walk over me. Yeah. Um, and understanding that I am, my, I am still a person. I am a woman. I am a black woman and I have morals and I have standards and I have ethics and that just because you're older than me and more experienced than me and white <laughs> and a man don't mean yeah. you get to talk to me in a certain way. So thankfully, <laughs> like management wise was incredibly, you know what I mean? Like forthcoming and, you know, very cutthroat, but there were moments where I literally had to stand up and say, Hey, first of all, we ain't talking about shit like that. I don't care what the hell are you saying, but I'm not okay with it. And there were little things like they would nickname me. Oh my gosh. Um, they would, cause my name is Candace. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Candace. <laughs> I said, you can call me anything you want, but you can't say Kansas or candy. One, because uh -huh. I'm not a state and two, I'm not a stripper. 
So don't <laughs> fucking call me that, right? And <laughs> and they all and they're all dudes and they're joking and they love shooting the shit and making fun of each other and they're like, oh, 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 oh. and then one time, I will not name his name, but he knows who he is. We cool, so I don't care about <laughs> that. But <laughs> he calls me, he calls me Kansas under his breath. Because we all, uh, um, when we when we go into the kitchen, we all acknowledge each other and we say hello. And then when we leave, we acknowledge each other and say hello. Yeah. And I was leaving and I said, bye, you guys. And he says, bye, Kansas, under his breath. And then I stopped and I was like, I don't know if I heard that right, but I'm, I'm late for something, so I leave. And then it happens the next day. And he says it. And I stop him. And I said, what the hell did you just say to me? And he literally looked like he shat his pants. And everybody <laughs> stopped and like looked. And they were like, oh my goodness. And I was all like, what did you just say? And he was like, I was like, what is my name again? And he goes, Candace. I was like, say it louder for the people in the back. I didn't hear you. And he said, <clears throat> Candace. And I was like, that's what I thought. Don't ever try to play with me again. It's nice. things like that are minor. And it's, and I don't know if it's a guy thing or a, a ranking thing or what, but I think you have to, well, for me personally, you have to show dominance at an early stage to, to set a precedent that people will only treat you the way that you let them. And I am not okay with being or feeling disrespected because I'm uncomfortable as it is already all the time. And I don't need to add more pressure to that to make another white man feel better about themselves or to feel more comfortable because that's not my fucking job so i will demand respect and i will and i will only accept like i said i will accept the the type of behavior that i feel should be reciprocated towards me because i don't have a problem with you but if you have a problem with me then we'll address it we'll talk it out or whatever but i am not okay with having to always always like like I said, pick your battles. <laughs> I, I picked my battles when I, when I felt that it was worth standing up for myself and understanding what I was worth and what I was willing to compromise for myself. Yeah. Um, there were moments that I wish I didn't hold my tongue, um, but that's, that's on me. And you know I've learned from those occasions, but for the most part, I said what I needed to say because I wasn't afraid of those children. I was the yeah. youngest person there and I was acting the most grown up. What the, what the hell? So <laughs> I don't, you know what I mean? And like I said, for the most part, they were good guys, but there were moments where I had to check them on the privilege and it was unfortunate, but it was necessary. And hopefully they learned something from it, but at the same time, it's not always my necessary job to educate them. Mm -hmm. um, but it is to, it is my job to t to tell them to stand up for myself and what I deem appropriate to me when you're in the company of me. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. Do you? So I know both of us have read Becoming by Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. which is an incredible book. And if you haven't read it, you definitely should. Um, <laughs> and she, <laughs> she talks about uh, the like angry black woman like concept and how that was a fear of hers that she and it all it did happen but she that was something she really wanted to keep um out of the media she didn't want people to perceive her as an angry black woman like during the beginning of her husband's race she wasn't smiling she wasn't like she was she was campaigning for her husband and mm -hmm. people were taking that um, and kind of like raking her through the mud for not being the, the ideal woman that people want. Is that fear something that you have? Do you care? Is that something that you don't give a shit about because, you know, you're yourself? I, 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 I want to hear your perspective on like that concept. I mean, I think it just goes back with vulnerability. Um, and there are already so many pressures to be black and there are already so many pressures to be a woman and then they're, and then they're combined. And then, so you're constantly, you're constantly trying to figure out, uh, 
a middle ground and and it's a lot of insecurities it's a lot of anxiety and it's just hard and i would say that when i was 23 years old working in a new unfamiliar territory around people that don't look like me then yes to an extent i was i was I was definitely very aware that any time I made a, um, what's the word? Anytime I was vulnerable, anytime I was angry, quote unquote, or sassy mm -hmm. or whatever, that it made an impact. And I don't know if that was negative or positive, but it was just how I was feeling. And it's unfortunate that we're put in that box because we are all humans and we are all people and if i wasn't black um i was just a woman i would still seem like a hysterical yeah female exactly. and if, it was, if i was a black man i <laughs> i would look like a raging black man like i would look aggressive or dangerous so <laughs> the only way like i i have seen so many things i have seen and most of them are white men throw fucking plates against the wall, throw chairs at people, fucking set shit on fire because they were throwing a goddamn temper tantrum and nobody, it, it, it wasn't phased. And some of these weren't in a managerial position. Okay. Yeah. So to go back, it's like, it's hard because it's, it's about vulnerability. It's about, wondering man am i able to cry right now am i able to be angry right now am i able and it sucks that you have to think about that before you actually feel your fucking feelings you know yeah. what i mean you know you're already feeling them <laughs> but you don't want to you want to you don't want to be perceived a certain way and be put in this fucking box of the quote unquote mm -hmm. angry black woman you know what i mean yeah. i'm a passionate fucking person but anytime my voice gets a little bit excited Calm down, Candace. First of all, PSA out there. Don't ever tell a woman to calm down, relax, or smile. It does not work out, okay? It does not get the reaction that you fucking want, okay? Second of all. So real. So <laughs> oh. real. Anyway, um, it's, it's, it's infuriating um, yeah. that I can't be able to express myself without a society putting me into a box. That's yeah. what I'm saying. And I can't be vulnerable without it. Like, you know what I mean? I, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> no, it does. I really appreciate that. And I think it sheds light on like just being a female in general in the restaurant industry too. Like yeah. that's hard enough and yeah. you're fucking crushing it. <laughs> Thank you for Thanks for being the light. You know, I really <laughs> The misogyny and the racism is real. <laughs> Yeah. Da, 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 da. Hey! <laughs> oh yeah so with that do you have any advice that you would like to give to aspiring black women out there who want to become chefs who want to be professionals in whatever field i think i don't know do you have anything to say that like from yeah. your own experience um um hashtag black girl magic <laughs> hashtag, we are the unicorns um i say do whatever you want girl <laughs> like do whatever you want and yeah. i'm not saying it's gonna be easy and i say this for anybody and i say this especially for a person of color and i say this especially for women of color do whatever you want girl like and 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 just put your whole heart and soul into it if it's your fucking dream then just do it dude if you find out you don't like it then whatever but at least you tried at least you didn't let something like society or or somebody that doesn't believe in you or or just common misconceptions or insecurities get in the way of that because there are so many things that we have done that we are doing and that we can do in this world you know what i mean so i say go for it and please 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 we need more we need more diversity diversity is so important representation matters it is so critical for the the continuing and the in the, the high function 
of this fucking country, of this world, because everybody is different. And everybody has something to contribute for the most part. We ain't talking about the crazies and the randos, but I'm talking about <laughs> the people with potential. I'm talking about the people that I'm saying yes. That's all I'm saying. Yes, yes, yes. Please go out there and do it. Don't don't listen to the negatives and and the people saying that you can't do it and that you're not worthy and that you're not strong or you're not capable because you are. There are so many beautiful examples out there and and I am a living, breathing one. I am living my dream. It is hard and it is difficult every fucking day, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. It is, I, it is, food is something that transcends all of us. It is universal. It is, it is something that gives us life, literally. <laughs> and it is an art form as well in order for us to express ourselves. So I'm saying, please just don't give up on you. Don't give up on your dream and and work hard and and see it through. Yeah. That's all Beautiful. <laughs> Wise That's words. All. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you so much. That's so sweet. Like um, during these crazy times, are you what have you been up to? And what have you been thinking about, you know, with all the protests going on and so much controversy happening and you know this wasn't like a rant like with the whole george floyd murder and like this was not a random action this, is, this has happened many many times like what is it that you've been doing during this time especially during quarantine where you know we don't have um a lot of contact with other people how have you been kind of processing all of this um or even like funneling that you know yeah yeah it's 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 been it's been very difficult um i live in san francisco i live in a studio apartment by myself um so <laughs> think of the rent everybody um <laughs> and, also, <laughs> and also it's one of those things where I was talking to my best friend about it, um, who was also black, and we were just discussing the the death of George Floyd before the riots and the looting and the protesting and such. And um, I told her, I was said, "This is like I'm just so sick and tired. I'm just so so tired of." us dying i'm so tired of them killing us like i am like i was on the verge of tears of just like so it's being so frustrated about the right. entire situation and she's like yes honey because she's back in los angeles and she's like yes i understand i feel you and i was just like but it and i said it and it, i i felt bad but at the same time i was like you know what if his death is any indication of what the future can hold like oh my goodness and but it can also be used as a catalyst you know what i mean like i i i, I just pray that he him and brianna taylor and amon arbery those are just the recent ones you yeah. know what i mean those, those are just in the past three months not to mention years and years um that it can it can it won't be in vain you know what i mean and it, not 12 hours later there have there were protests there were worldwide protests i'm talking london i'm talking berlin i'm talking i, I it just everywhere in major major cities across the world just rioting and just just outrage because we are done we are so fucking tired of us dying and i and i felt for it and at first i was very resistant about the the looting and the um and the and the riots and the you know setting cop cars on fire and yada yada, yada. and you know i was just like man i don't know if that's the way but then i sat on it and i thought about it and like the person in me was like, man, that's really sucks. But the black person in me was like, burn that shit to the fucking ground because we are, we're done being peaceful. We are done. Black, like, black Lives Matter started as a peaceful protest years ago after they started addressing police brutality towards black people in America. Mm -hmm. And 
we were still fucking dying. We are, we like, we have done everything we can possibly fucking think of peacefully to do this. So the reason that they are setting shit on fire, the reason that they are burning things to the ground is because we are so fed up and angry and we are finally getting the attention that we fucking deserve. Not another person dying, but outrage, physical, literal, empirical evidence of outrage because we are done. And that is why, and that's why I felt with my brothers and sisters. I was like, you know what? If, if this is if this is gonna get everybody's fucking attention, I don't mind a goddamn multi-billion dollar corporation of Target burning to the fucking ground. Light that shit on fire. I don't care, okay? <laughs> because I'm so done. Y'all ain't listening to us. That's why we had to go to extremes. MLK was dope, but his ass got shot because he was peaceful. You know what I mean? Malcolm X, one of the most radical people there, he also got shot, don't get me wrong, but he called a little bit more, you know what I mean? Yeah, and it's, yeah. And it's insane that it took this long, it took another man, it took a video. What if that video was not there? It took an eight and a half to nine minute video of a white man choking another black man with his knees. Mm -hmm. just to apprehend him for something that he wasn't even supposed to be arrested for. And in general, like he wasn't resisting arrest. Regardless, regardless. I yeah, know. yeah. Regardless. They are, happening for, they are happening for a reason. It is not just blind outrage. It yeah. is driven, dedicated outrage because like I'll say it for a ninth time, we are done. We are not okay with what is happening to our people. I should not feel this way every single time I walk out of the fucking door. I should not have to feel afraid. I should not have to feel afraid. This is awful. And yeah. I'm trying to contain myself. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great. It's a lot. And I know it's a lot for non-people of color to understand, um, but it's, we're done. And there is no time for ignorance at this point. Because there's no, there's, it, 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 it is not, it's unacceptable. It's, it's not okay. It is not okay for the snide comments anymore. It's not okay for the microaggressions. It is not okay for you to be able to call the cops on us when we are standing in Central Park watching a fucking bird. It is not okay. Yeah. And that power needs to be dismantled. That power of 400 years of oppression to add on to more, that was just when we were freed, mm. needs to be dismantled. And that is the most, that is the hardest thing. You know what I mean? And the most recent thing is the police, but it also relates back to power. And it's the fact that they feel like they have a certain hold on us even though we are just humans, even though we are just trying to exist out here, like God gave us a different skin tone, so that means we deserve to die. That don't make no goddamn sense. It doesn't make any sense. So it has taken me a lot of time and energy and crying and <laughs> anger <laughs> to come to a, a, a place of somewhat solace. Um, I have been, I had to disassociate myself from the media and social media for almost a week in order to feel like a person again, um, because it's a, it's a hard balance between becoming informed, but also oversensitized. And this is not a time to be oversensitized mm -hmm. um, or desensitized. Uh, desensitize, I think. Yeah. Desensitize. Um, I don't want to have too much information where I'm like, oh, oh, that again. You know what I mean? Um, that's basically what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to find a balance. I'm trying to find an in-between of still understanding what is going on in the world, but also trying to maintain my mental health. Um, so I have like I said, I disassociated myself for almost a week and then I just kept myself busy. I, I called um, 
I called my mama, I called my sister, I called my brother, I called my dad, I called my best friend, I called all the black people I knew, and I just talked to them and had beautiful and heart-wrenching conversations with them. I didn't talk to a white person for like two days. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, it was not intentional, but it just happened because I was just, yeah. I don't, I, I, like, and it was beautiful uh, how many allies I have in my life, which is great. Um, but at the same time, a lot of it, it's, it, it, it has everything to do with me, but it doesn't in the mm -hmm. sense of it's not my job to make you feel better. It's not my job to make you feel better about your white guilt. It's not my job to educate you. It's not my job for any of that shit. If you want to be there for me, then go out there and do something because- of I pride myself in and and having people in my life that I trust and I know and that I you know genuinely care for so I felt fine with all of my friends like I know my friends ain't racist I wouldn't be friends with them <laughs> but, but there is a matter of ignorance of course but it's not my job you know what I mean it's not my responsibility to make you feel better about yourself and how you feel about me you know what I mean like it's <laughs> like at, at that point it ain't about me it's about you again so I like I want them to educate. I want them to have con hard conversations with the racist aunts and uncles and aunties and grandmamas and such and yeah and 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 have be uncomfortable for once in your fucking life and and step into my shoes maybe mm -hmm. just a little of that sense of uncomfortability of that sense of 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 loss and hurt and anguish, you know what I mean? And obviously they will never feel the way that I do, to, you know what I mean? But if they feel uncomfortable for a little bit, they'll get a sense of that fucking prejudice, I swear. And understanding that it'll help you grow if you wanna grow, you know what I mean? So I've also been just, you know, investing in things that make me feel better. I've been cooking a lot lately, I've been, um i've been reading i've been watching um i've been listening to music you know mm -hmm. and um i also accidentally only listen to black artists i only watch black tv shows i watch <laughs> black comedians black podcasts you name it like it was only black yeah. content it actually made me really really uplifted and 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 it made me feel really good it made me feel better um, because black people are dope and it's really easy to do to eat to listen to amazing content shout out um <laughs> be running things i'm just saying but <laughs> that made me feel better and mm -hmm. um it's a new week um things are still you know very intentions are very very high still but i uh um i'm i'm still I'm, the proof is in the pudding honestly mm -hmm. I, I i i'm not going to feel better about things necessarily like overall until shit is actually like in my face happening like already signed sealed delivered you know what i mean like yeah. all, that, all that shit is talk and that shit is cheap i want the check cashed in my hand you know what i mean so until shit is like done yeah I, we gonna still be holding up our signs we still gonna be marching you know why because the civil rights movement did not take a day it did not take a week it took a whole ass long time yeah <laughs> okay um and this is just a start like people are, people are calling him the modern day emmett till and it's like mm -hmm. it they're not wrong you know what i mean like something horrific has happened to a black man in this country and you and you all know about it now you all deserve to see what is happening before your very eyes we need to do something about it so I don't know. It's 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 hard to manage the perspectives, the current perspectives right now, um, to stay informed. But also, I, I need to also be a little selfish in the sense of I got to take care of my mind and my body and my spirit. You know what I mean? And COVID's still out here, y'all. So that's another that's another thing that I'm worried about the black community because they are doing something so beautiful and they are going out there and they're, they're standing up for our people. And, and so are others, you know, we got plenty of allies, but it's also unfortunate because a lot of those communities are in poorer neighborhoods with less access to healthcare, with less access to, um, to testing and, um, and medical uh, resources. So if they getting sick, like, 
shit. You know what I mean? Um, so it's kind of a catch-22. The world is ending, but <laughs> we are out here. We are trying. Um, yeah. there, there's a beautiful quote. It says, um, it's amazing that be- uh, that Black people are only just fighting for equality and not revenge. And that's correct. You yeah. Know what I mean? like- like we we just want to be we just want to exist we just want to be equal y'all we ain't we ain't trying to like uh, uh, like oppress y'all we ain't trying to we ain't trying to turn you into slaves or anything we just want to live we just want to raise our kids we just want to go to work we just want to have fun we just want to be in society without feeling like there's a target on our back yo and it's so unfortunate because that's the way this country was built that was the foundation on which this country was built and it's 600 years later and nothing in 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 change yeah to an extent you know well let's hope that you know conversations like this keep happening and Mm -hmm. conversations like this with you know just like you said all of our racist family members and whenever you hear a stupid comment that you stand up like no matter who you are white black brown asian like it doesn't matter you Mm -hmm. know and i really appreciate you giving me the time and and um sharing your story with us and uh it's really enlightening and it's really been um a productive conversation i really appreciate you so much and i love you so much and you know it's we've talked hours and hours and hours about this topic and i really appreciate um you as a person and you in my life and all that you've had to say has been super helpful and i really hope that we can keep having these conversations and having conversations with our friends and with our politicians and people who are making legislation. And, you know, you're right. Things aren't going to change unless we stand up and do it. And that means even the little things. So I really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Candice. I love you so much, friend. I love you too. (laughs) (laughs) This has been wonderful, really. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say, like, you want me, I, I could talk for hours, girl. You ain't never lie. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any, uh, any last uh, things you'd like to say? Any closing comments before we wrap it up? Yeah, I mean, um, just um, speak out, educate, stand up for yourself. These are just like life lessons that I've learned. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and, just spread, spread the word, spread love, y'all, and not hate. Please, Lord have mercy. It's so much easier. It's so yeah. much easier. And keep fighting. That's all I got to say. It's, it's, it's a long road ahead. And Black people are the most resilient human beings I have ever known. History has proven that. Yeah. And I just don't want... I don't want us to give up on, on, like I said, we just, we just want to live. We just want to follow our dreams and raise our kids and, and just be a lot, just be, we deserve that more just as anyone else, because we are, we all got blood. We all got skin. And I just shout out to, to anybody that has fought the good fight and continues to fight the good fight. Um, My heart is with all of y'all. Black lives matter, black lives matter, black lives matter, black lives matter. And that's all I got to say.